picture or turn and make sure your video is off if you don't want to be known here. So for everybody joining, please turn off your video, mute yourself. We would hate to have to kick you out. All right. Welcome everyone to this um, rather impromptu TW Logos training for intermediate advanced users. Thank you to Paulo Rear and Doug Higby and Jeff Heath and Matthew Lee who have agreed to be facilitators in the chat box. So anytime you feel lost or confused, please, um, if you're a participant here, feel free to post something in the chat box and we've got a number of specialists here with us who will either follow up with you after or try to answer your question now. So Paul, thank you so much for joining us straight away after your vacation. What a treat. I use Lagos every single day. And that's not an exaggeration. Either in my work or at home when I'm reading, you know, I do lots of reading and private study on my iPad. Having the Logos app loaded up on my phone in my iPad, it is such a blessing to have access to all these resources. So Paul, I just need to know, whom do we have to thank for this cornucopia of resources that we've been <laughs> gifted in DW Logos? Who, who should we thank? Myriads of myriads of angels, right? Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it started way back with Katie Barnwell um, in the early 90s, uh, having a vision for TW as a, as a, as a you know, a digital bookshelf or digital library. Um, and so it's a combination of SIL's own resources, but then there was a lot of connection with UBS, for example, with uh, the Greek New Testament and the UBS handbooks. So we have a lot to thank them for. Um, but as you're also mentioning, Logos, of course, and uh, Zondervan and Erdmans and Baker. Zondervan is our biggest contributor at the moment as far mm -hmm. as a third party uh, publisher. And we're just super grateful for them. As most of you know, I think it was about two years ago, we had a, about $5,000 worth of resources for each translator, which adds up to you know, over millions <laughs> of dollars worth of, of a gift. Uh, and we basically got a similar kind of gift uh, just a few, uh, about a month ago. And so wow. from Zondervan again. So really that grateful is, for that. That is amazing. So I feel led to offer a prayer of thanks just for all that. I mean, this is empowering Bible translation in heretofore unknown ways. I don't know. Is there anybody on the chat who would, I don't know, should I just call on somebody? Um, how about, uh, who should I call on to pray? Who's feeling led to pray? I just feel really thankful for all this. I feel thankful for you, Paul. Um, I'm going to get spiritual for my, my, my boy, Jonathan. Jonathan Vandenbroek, could you just offer a, a somewhat quick prayer of thanks for everything that we've been gifted here in, um, in TW Lagos? Sure, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I want to thank you uh, for those people that Paul uh, has mentioned to us, starting back there with Katie Barnwell and her inspiration and idea to put these things as resources for other Bible translators to use. Thank you for those who have followed on from that and built on it. Thank you for the, uh, the publishers that have uh, been so generous with their resources and provided those things for us. Lord, thank you for each one uh, and what is available. And Lord, uh, uh, pray for your continued blessing uh, on this and resources like them. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, uh, I'd also just be remiss if I didn't mention uh, our GPS publishing services mm. who manages all the license uh, requests and interacting with the publishers for the agreements, the intellectual property agreements. Uh, please do uh, include them in your thanks as well. Sometimes okay. they... Uh, they might feel like people might feel like it's more of a, a, a problem dealing with getting the licenses, but they actually do a lot of work for us. And okay. uh, I want to express my sincere thanks for them as part of the equation. Yes. No, thank you so much, Paul. And uh, I know it takes a team. So we're just so grateful. I mean, to be, it, this is perhaps the best $50 a Bible translation practitioner <laughs> can spend right now. It's phenomenal. All right. So let's jump right in here. I think it's important, Paul, when we talk about TW Logos to make sure people, even intermediate or advanced users, understand what we're actually dealing with here. Perhaps some of the frustration that some users have could come down to kind of a misunderstanding of what we actually have. So when I think about Logos, I think of it as a bookshelf, a very powerful 
um, modified, very, uh, I don't know, very tricked out bookshelf. And then I think of translators workplace as books or resources on that bookshelf. Um, how does that metaphor work for you? I, I just want us to understand which part of this, so what is the logos part of what we have and what is the translator's workplace part of what we have? I just wanna help clear up any confusion or frustration that people might have. Yeah, that's a very good question and it's really important, uh, especially as we deal with support related issues. So if we think about logos as, um, yeah, bookcase or it's almost like a, a, a vehicle or a, you know, a shipping vehicle a container. Um, Logos provides the, the avenue for us to look at all this content, to use all this content, to interact with all this content, but they're really just uh, like the, the, the mechanism that we use, right? And so Logos then as a, as a company sells a lot of resources, not, not only their own, but also a lot of third party like the Zondervan resources. Mm -hmm. uh, so even though you're buying them on Logos's website, they are licensing them from Zondervan. So it's like buying a, a resource from Zondervan but you're using it in their, in their bookshelf. And so, right. so for us, for TW, we've got all these third party um, publishers like Zonovan and Erdman's and Baker, et cetera. We also have all our SIL content and, and UBS content. Some of that is not available to the general public. Hmm. And so a lot of it actually. And so when we have, uh, even this package, this collection of resources and how we, how we have this $50 price point, all that kind of stuff, is really by virtue of us managing the entire package. So SIL is managing this entire collection of resources. Uh, Logos is the, is the generous uh, platform truck that lets us use all their equipment to ship it uh, yeah. and to maintain it and update it. Uh, but really everything is mostly down to us. So even the purchases, okay. so when you're paying $50, you're not paying it to Logos, you're paying it to us. Okay. Um, and so for any support issues, this is a very similar kind of question that really um, people will often get confused and think, oh, I need to go to, log to the Logo support site and ask them to fix my registration or get mm -hmm. figure out what's wrong with TW Logos. And Logos doesn't, you know, Faith Life doesn't really know a lot about that. Uh, mm -hmm. They know some, but, but it's not, they're not really uh, front and center in that equation. So really you need to come to, to SIL to deal with that. Okay, so if it's a question about registration or licensing or that sort of thing, it, um, it comes down to SIL, and by no means should anyone ever leave the Translators Workplace Faith yes. Life Group. Is that right? That That's is the correct. ticket. Yeah, that so you correct. are exiting, you are forfeiting your license for all of our TW Logos resources if you exit that group. So please, for the love of all things librarian, do not leave that Faith Life Group. All right, so, uh, but I want to explain that for a moment too. Let me explain that for a moment. Yeah. So, I mean, the purpose of that too is that the reason we have this generous um, collection of resources is because publishers have been, you know, not only generous in making them available to us, but there is a little bit of a restriction on it. And, and as you know that, if you're going through the application process, you know, they're making these available on the basis that you're using them for Bible translation as a kind of a, yeah. uh, a ministry purpose. And so their assumption then is then that we're not selling these permanently or publicly to anybody. And so the way we're able to protect that is by having this, this registration process that uses that right. faith life group. And okay. so if somebody is a bad player out there or is, is copying content from these resources and making it available freely when it's not theirs to make it available freely, or, you know, if there's, if they're bad mouthing other organizations, we have ways of removing you from the group if you're a bad actor. Uh, and denying you those resources. That's basically wow. the purpose of that whole we, we don't want that. We don't want that. Don't. Okay, so let's move, let, let's, let's just talk briefly. Um, we're gonna move into some hands-on stuff, but I just wanna clarify one thing. So Logos, if I understand rightly, gives us the bookshelf, the vehicle for free. So anybody in the world can freely download um, the Logos 8 engine and have the Logos 8 basic package, right? Um, and so sometimes I see people a bit frustrated by the marketing that we get from Logos to buy this or that or whatever, but it's important to note that the actual bookshelf, the engine, the motor, however, the, the vehicle is free. Um, and so there's no reason why people should not update, right, to the Logos 8 software. Please and that do. doesn't mean that you have to, that doesn't mean you have to shell over hundreds of dollars or pounds or... Right yen or whatever for a base package 
it's a free bookshelf, there, right? There is one, one caveat to that. Uh, yeah. This is Matthew Lee. Um, they, when, when Logos comes out with a new version of their software, for a few months, that version of their software is only available to paid customers. Right. Uh -huh. So for two or three months after, for example, the release of whatever will be Logos 9, uh, it will only be accessible to paid customers. And after right. that, the engine becomes free for everyone and you can get the free upgrade. Oh, right. uh, so that, okay. is, that is one of the caveats. If you're not a paid user, you do have to wait a little while. And okay. if, you're on the, if you're on the Faith Life group, you'll see that we will post messages letting you know of these, of these updates when they're coming or, or you know, when, they'll be, when they are available for you to, to do that kind of update. Okay, so the latest version of the free Logos bookshelf now is, is Logos 8. 8. That's correct, That's right? right? Yes. But when Logos 9 comes out, there will be a period where you can only buy it, but then if you just hold your horses, you'll be able to get the engine for free. Right, okay. Right. So essentially what people need to do is have Logos. Now, I know this is for intermediate advanced users, but I want to avoid frustration here. So you get the bookshelf for free. You talk to SIL for 50 bucks. You get sweet, sweet resources, and they, just, they, they hook you up. Um, but the TW Logos package, if I understand rightly, does not include features does not enhance your bookshelf with book lights and chairs and coffee machines. It just, it gives you books and resources. Is that right? Uh, it does have a little bit more than the basic engine. It's a bit hard to explain. There was some, some uh, when we first went to Logos, I think in Logos 6 or 7, um, we did negotiate to get some additional features that were part of kind of an extended feature set. It was a cross-grade feature set, they called it, uh -huh. I think, at the time. Okay. Um, and those have, those have carried along, I think, with our versions as we've gone forward. But so it's, it is a little bit more than just the engine. Okay, all right. But it's, but it's not very easily defined. <laughs> right, okay, that's fine. If it's complicated, we don't need to get into it. All right, um, so what I have here, Paul, is I have a list of some of the features that I was hoping that we could go over that I think would be very useful to our intermediate to advanced users. Now, in my role as a translation consultant, when I'm consulting, I have Logos open um, and I'm alt tabbing between paratext and Logos, kind of using them in complementary fashion. And one of the things um, that I enjoy the most is using the double and triple click features. Um, so can you walk us through what is that? How do we set that up? And what's that useful for? Sure, so um, one of the most common uses for a double click would be, for example, here I'm looking at the Greek New Testament on my left-hand panel. Uh, if this is too small for you, let, let us know. I'll make it a little bit larger. But if I wanted to, say, go to a lexicon entry uh, in, from the Greek text, one of the easiest ways would be to just be able to double click if I could. And so if I just try to double click now, it should actually open. Yeah, it's opening the Anlex currently to that lexical entry for this term, proskaleo. Um, and, but, so that's sort of the default, I believe that's the default setting, but if you want to check your settings, you can go to the tools menu and there's this program settings option. You, if you scroll around in this, in this tools menu, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff and sometimes it's a little bit hard to navigate, but they have also this little section up at the top, which is another tray where you can move things up into that tray uh, or you can take things off. Um, and I, well, I, you can also drag things up to the toolbar here. So I've dragged this program settings up to this toolbar and I can just click on that. And now it's opened in my, in my left-hand pane here. And if we wanna go to the double and triple clicks, you can scroll, I think, down to the bottom. Yeah, you see here in this text display area, let me make this a little larger. There's, a, there's kind of different sections here in the settings. So under text, text display, you'll mm -hmm. see a little bit further down, there's double click action and triple click action. So mm -hmm. double click, if you click on that little drop down arrow, it gives you the option of look up, search, search in line or select words. So, so depending on what you want to do commonly with that, mm -hmm. you can set that up the way you want to. And similarly for the triple click, it has similar kind of features where you can select again, which, which kind of thing you want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I wanted to do uh, look, uh, uh, say select paragraph here, let's try that. Mm -hmm. Oops. 
Yeah, it's a paragraph. So now if I'm in the NIV here, I can triple click on said, and there it's now selected the whole paragraph. Mm -hmm. right? Nice. Nice. Okay, so as a consultant, what I often find is I need quick access to dictionaries, encyclopedias. I need quick background information on, say, a key term, a place, a name. So if I'm looking at your John, uh, sorry, I can read uh, Mark 6 verse four, uh, what's the preceding verse? verse three, and say I just wanted to quickly get more information about Judas. I just need some quick information. What I'm gonna do as a consultant is I'm just gonna double click. I have my double click settings set to look up. And so if you, what happens when you double click on Judas? In this case, I have it going to a lexicon as my first look up choice. Okay. And so right. because I have look up and because my, so now we're getting into prioritization. So yes, prioritization is, is what affects yeah. your, what happens here. Okay, so this is important, I think. So Very important. Um, double click will have it look up a word, any resource that you click on. I think it's for any resource, whether it's a Bible, a dictionary, an encyclopedia. If you want quick information on any word, you can double click on it. And then what it looks up in is whatever we have prioritized. Is that what you're saying? So now yes. we need to kind of move into prioritizing resources in order to kind of tell Logos which resource we want to look up that term in. All right, so can you show us how to do that, Paul? Yeah, so that's another important area. So the, the, your library menu, it might look like um, this when you first look at it, and just letting you know that there's different options for how you can view your library menu. I always like to go to the details view. It's a little more compact, and you can see the titles right away. Uh, so then when you're wanting to prioritize, there's this little shish kebab icon, the three dots, uh, vertical dots, up on the top right of this library menu. If you click that, left click, then you'll see it has these, this option for information or for prioritized resources. Information lets you see something about a resource you're looking at. Prioritized resources opens up a pane that lets you then choose what is kind of the, the hierarchy or the preference order of, of uh, resources you want to do lookups in. So in this case, um, I happen to have had this pocket lexicon to the Greek New Testament as my, pref my preferred lexicon. Mm. And that's what happened. That's why this PLGNT is what came up when I double clicked there. Right. But you clicked, you double clicked on the NIV 84. Yeah. And so it, let me talk about that for a second too. It took uh, you to the Greek lemma. Now, yeah. the reason why the NIV 84 took you to the Greek lemma is because the yeah. NI 80, NIV 84, right, has been, um, what do you call it? Has been- As a reverse interlinear. <laughs> yes, okay, good, yeah. So it's been mapped to the Greek text. So when you right. double click, Logos knows that you actually want more information on the lemma standing behind the English translation, right. And so there are a number of English translations right, like that, right? So there's the NIV 84, the latest NIV 2011, the ESV, um, the Christian Standard Bible. Um, what other ones? Um, the King James, the Lexham okay. English Bible. Yeah. Um, uh, did we say RSV? I think RSV is in there. The NRSV, uh, yeah. You should also note, though, that just because um, even though this, even though we clicked on English and got to Greek, I mm -hmm. think there's probably a hierarchy hierarchy that it'll work through as well in terms of what it'll look for. So if I were to put this Easton's Bible Dictionary in here above Pocket Lexicon, it's quite possible it will go to that first. So let me see what happens. Get out of the way. Try it again. Oh, no, didn't kick, didn't kick in in that case. I was, I'm pretty sure though that there will be cases where it will find something. It'll probably go to English first, and then if it doesn't find something in your list for English, then it'll go. It'll kind of go oh, through senses or through the Greek or whatever. It would fall back. All right, Paul, could you bring up that prioritize resources menu again? I, yeah. To be honest, I find this prioritize resources menu a little bit confusing because I see here that you have a number of resources, but they're not all applicable in the same way, if that makes sense. So, um, 
So we, we double click. So what I'm most interested in is which resource will come up when I double click. If I have my double click settings set to look up, um, how do I know which one of these in the list of prioritized resources is going to be the one that actually comes up? Because it's not going to bring up NIV 84. It's not going to bring up NIV. It's not going to bring up, you know, so on. So how yeah. does it, why is it that it only, does that make sense? It does make sense. And I'm not sure I have a very clean answer for you, but certainly like when it comes to dealing with lexicons, you're going to want to look at the, the resources that have lexicon in the title or dictionary. Okay. Um, but then for things like Bible versions, um, this yeah. is what these are used for when you're like hovering over a verse reference and wow. what will be the preferred thing here. So now like if I'm over here in, in the, this lexicon, if I hover over Matthew 1-2, they'll probably show me the Matthew 1-2 in English from NIV 84. Yeah. All right. And that's because you have NIV 84 all the way at the Correct. top. Okay. All right. And so if I were to put my Greek New Testament in here as a prioritized resource above that, then it would actually show me the Greek here. Okay, and how is that different than setting one's um, preferred default, default version? It's not. It's basically the same thing. Same, okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and so that's, that's the tricky part. And so when you, um, this also will affect your mobile experiences as well. So if you, mm -hmm. if you use Logos on your iPhone or Android phone or your tablet, um, and you're wondering how, why is it when I'm going into this verse reference, it's always bringing me to the Greek or it's always bringing me to some other resource. How can I change that? Well, the only place you can change that is actually here in the desktop. <laughs> um, right. So it syncs your accounts everywhere. So it's a very interesting effect yeah. to know that. Paul, can you click on the word on the column heading for type for a moment? I want to show yes. you something to explain a little bit about this. So in Logos, there are a bunch of different types of resources. And so if you're clicking on a Bible reference, it's going to, um, it's going to want to take you to a Bible or a uh, Bible apparatus or a, um, uh, a lectionary, well, not a lectionary, um, or a commentary. Um, if you are clicking on a word, it's going to want, you to want to take you to a dictionary or a lexicon. Right. And so um, it's going to do its best to find the right resource, but... Um, it's going to listen to your prioritization first. So as he said, if you have an English Bible prioritized above a Greek uh, lexicon and it has that word, which maybe Easton's Bible Dictionary doesn't have Judas, that's doubtful, but that would be very odd. But uh, normally it's going to prioritize the one on top, but it does it sort of by category of what you're looking for, if that makes any sense. Yep. Okay. That sounds good. I think we're ready to move on from the double click and triple click. So we've talked about setting up double click, setting up triple click. Um, we've talked about prioritizing resources. Um, I think that's good. Now, just to tell you, so my double click settings are set to look up. So Judas for me would take me to a lexicon or something like that. And then my triple click is set to inline search because what okay. I often find what I often find as a consultant is, okay, here's Judas in this passage. I want to, I want to quickly see where else Judas is mentioned in that resource. So if I have my triple click set to uh, inline search, I would triple click on Judas and then it would give me kind of a collapsed view of all the different verses where Judas is found. Like that. Um, is that, is that the inline search? Yes. I did, I, I missed it. Can you, can you show us again? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, there you go. Oops. So is that it? Yeah. Yeah, so that's really cool. You see here in the search box, it's actually filled in lemma colon and it's put in the Greek lemma for you and it's shown you, I mean, this is very handy if you're trying to quickly see where else a given lemma occurs. Um, helpful in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. You just want to quick, so it's giving us there, you know, Mark 14, 10. Um, and so it's actually showing us for the whole NIV 84. So that's just a quick way to see, okay, where else is Judas talked about? And then we're there. And that's just from triple clicking. So it took me a while. I had to practice to do the triple click, but once I got it, you know, it, it was really helpful. Good. All right. Um, so I hope we're not going too fast here, but I would like to talk about collections next. 
Um, I'm not talking about taking up an offering to send you on a cruise, Paul. I'm talking about setting up collections in Logos um, because these are, this is a very powerful way to do searches. It's a very powerful way to display the information that we want to see. It's another way to kind of prioritize the resources that we want to interact with. So could you walk us through a little bit, Paul, what it's like, how do we set up a collect, what is a collection and how do we set collections up? Sure, let me actually switch to a different version of Logos at the moment, because I have a, a good one set up there. Uh, if you'll notice, I was, I had a, I had a, my Logos was saying Verbum rather than Logos. Uh -huh. There are different versions of Logos available, and you can have more than, so that allows me to have two, two versions of Logos effectively, or TW up on the screen at the oh, same time, right. which is a nice, nice way to do something. And it's free too. Um, so yeah. we're talking about um, collections. So I have a collection that I was playing with called uh, TW, um, or like a discourse uh, analysis collection or a translation issues collection. So a collect what a collection is, is a way of kind of creating a subset of your library um, that is a specific, for a specific purpose. So if I'm wanting to search on articles that are specific to translation issues of a certain kind, I don't necessarily want to look up in a commentary or in a Bible version. I want to look up in specifically in um, like some, some of our, like the Bible translator journal yes, issues yes. or something else. And yes, so yes. What, I, what I've done there is I've created a collection. So to do that, you have this tools, you click on the tools menu and you click on collections. This brings up an interface then for defining collections. Initially it's going to kind of set you up for a new, unnamed collection. Uh, before I go into that, and let me just show you what I've done for some existing ones, like, like the ones I've mentioned. So I've got several. I've got this translation issues collection. I've got translators of workplace collection. I've got SILSSA's collection, exegetical summaries, Perseus Greek Latin, so the Perseus resources that are available for free as well. Um, so, I, so I've gone and created this translating student issues collection. And what I've done in that is to basically drag and drop resources into, into this little pane here that um, will be specific to the purpose of this collection. So I may have, uh, for example, these notes on translation issues, or have some, some resources like questions on re and rhetoric in the Greek New Testament. I have rhetorical questions in the New Testament, uh, translating the word of God. Uh, these are kind of resources that are going to be more interesting to me for specific, like translating a figure of speech issue than all the other kind of stuff uh, that I might have in my collection. So this is a way, like I'm saying, of, of again, of scoping down that content to a very specific set. Now to do that, I'll just go back and create a new one again. So we can just say like my collection and you can start playing with, like start with resources matching. So I might say TBT here. And so now that's given me, it already starts to go through my library and find all the TBT articles. So if I say, yeah, I really want that. So I'll just, so that's, that will be, if I just leave it like this, that will start with that as a collection. But I can also say plus these resources. And if I want to do plus these resources, I might want to open the library menu to do that. So I'm going to open the library menu and I'm going to dock the library. If you don't know how to, there's things you can do with the right click in, um, in Logos when you're looking at a library menu or looking at a resource. Sorry, uh, keep clicking one too many times. If I right click on it, you'll see it says open, open a new tab, or open in floating window. So I might want to have the library open all the time. I can just say open a new tab. And now I will have a library menu in a tab. This is a very handy thing to do. So now I could then look through here again. I can maybe say um, what will be some, somebody shout out something that I might want to put in my collection. Exegetical summaries? Exegetical summaries.
So we create a new collection and then we have to manually add the resources that we want to appear in that collection. So, so far you've added um, the Bible translator and now we're gonna add exegetical summaries. Right, so I could do that by saying start with resources matching, but that's a little bit, may not get everything you want. So if, if I'm doing it manually, I'm just going to I'm just going to now click on all of these in this um, in this view here and drag and drop them basically. Okay. So it you sounds can't like see it very well. Do not have the. It sounds like some people do not have the collections button. Is that a feature that is that needs to be enabled? Uh, uh, I think that, I'm pretty sure that's in the TW basic uh, collect. Uh, feature it might it might be not in the top area um, and down further in the the menu if you if you scroll down and look for it okay. like can you try library. searching for it in the top and yeah, you can also type it yeah yeah ah there it is yeah so yeah, several people have asked that question, and they've been they're they're finding it when they type it. If they if, even if they can't find it otherwise, that's good. Yeah. So the typing is a nice shortcut if you know the name of the tool. <laughs> and it, and, and if you if you know the type the name of the tool in the language of your interface, you have to type it in English if you're in English, in French if you're in French, in Portuguese if you're in Portuguese. Now people might not know that you can type collection or most keywords or menu items in Logos. You can also type in that. Um, what do they call that box? The enter passage or search box? The main one with the little green go button. Um, I just typed collection into that box and it, it popped up the option show collections or something. I don't know what that box is called though. They used to call it the go box. Uh, I'm not, I think they may have changed the name because there used to be two boxes. and in Or oh, the command box. One. Command, command is box, another. yeah. That's where, personally, when I can't remember where something is found in Logos, that's the first place I go, and I just start typing collections or whatever, and usually it comes up as an option. All right, so we've got our collection started here, Paul. Now, what might be really useful is, um, so we've got, once we've got a collection, can you show us now how can we search just within that collection? Sure. So now we've got this collection. I'm going to close it. I'm not sure that I have to, but I am anyway. It saves uh, automatically, right? It's yes. kind of nerve wracking when there's no save button. So you can exactly. give it a name, you can add resources, but no reason, no need to save anything. So now so if now we want to start a new search, I'm just going to click the little search, the, the magnifying glass on the left there. Okay. And I say the basic search, it'll probably usually come up in basic or Bible. I'm going to put click it onto basic specifically. And then uh, you're going to say, um, this where it says in New Testament or in King James, I'm going to say um, in a collection. And so when you click on these, knowing which one to click on is the tricky part. Um, there will be different options. Let's see. King James. And sometimes it'll take a little while to, to populate. So if I scroll down here, yeah, so now my collections they're starting to show up. And if I go to the very bottom, collections will show up at the very bottom of this drop down list. And wait, did I think we just passed it, didn't we? Uh, did we? Yeah, I think it was higher up. But it's good to see here the list of options that even if we don't create a separate collection for, say, the UBS handbook series, there is the option in the search to search just the UBS handbooks or, so there's a lot of options already populated in the search. Right, so now you're looking for our collection that we just created and there it is. Yeah, collections, my collection, yeah. Yeah, so just like we did with the tool, looking for the collections tool, you could do the same thing here. Where you, if you know the name of your collection, just type it in there and it'll find it, which is what I just did here. So I click it and now it's in a search only in my collection. And here I can also choose to not limit it to the New Testament. I can say all passages or, or whatever. Um, say all passages for, for kicks. And let's just say um, Romans 12, 1 or something. So now it's only looked within TBT, basically, and that one exegetical summary that I added to that collection for any reference to Romans 12, 1. 
and there we see these three different articles in, in, the, in the Bible translator that we have in, in Logos uh, for those articles. That's yeah, so you can imagine if you create a nice set of collections, yeah, then you can actually do something even more powerful, and that will be to create a guide. And I've we haven't talked a lot. I don't think we even have it in our list here, but I created something called a, a translation guide as a prototype. Mm. And I'm going to get it up here. Here we go. Transition guide. And so I have a couple different areas uh, that I've created. These guides are sort of a way of collecting um, useful built-in tools, but also things that can be kind of your own extended tools like these collections. So for example, if I am now studying um, Romans 12.1 here, it's going to pull up a whole bunch of stuff. You'll see it has textual variants, word by word, commentaries, grammars. I've added this, this translation issues collection that I created. Mm -hmm. I also have a discourse analysis collection that I created. And we're getting ready to have a key terms of the Old Testament uh, logos resource that is also a collection I've kind of prototyped in. Uh, and then you also can have lexicons, you can have your atlas or biblical events or places, a whole variety of things. You, you can customize what gets into this guide. This guide can then be docked off over to the side somewhere. And I can make this linked, for example, to my NIV. We didn't talk about link sets yet. No, I want to get there. And in fact, um, yeah, I was hoping to yeah, I, I want to. Am I in the weeds? <laughs> no, no, you're okay. You're okay. Yeah, the translation guide. I think we're okay without getting into how to create a guide quite yet. Um, I wanted to talk about one application that I found extremely helpful for what you've just done by creating a collection, um, and that is so. In my research, I often want to see where a given reference is mentioned in a collection. So for example, I've created a collection of Hebrew grammars, or I think, I think it's my biblical language grammar, so I include my Greek grammars and my Hebrew grammars. And when I'm working on a given passage, I want to know if that passage I'm working on is cited in a Hebrew grammar. Yeah, so yeah, great. the way I do that is first, I've created a collection of those Hebrew grammars, and so I think we've just seen how to create a collection. So you go to collection and then you would drag in all the grammars that you'd want. So you'd get um, Walt Key O'Connor, you'd get Juan, you, you know, you would add them all to a collection. And then what I do, Paul, while I'm researching is I open up a cited by pane. Um, are you able to open up the cited by pane? Let's try it. Cited by. So again, we look, went to the tools menu, started typing site, and there we get the cited by option. That will open in a moment. Whenever you share something through Zoom or, or Skype, it's always slower than when it's not. <laughs> okay, so now we have the cited by pane, and that's another very, yeah, very great. So if we open up the cited by pane, we can put it wherever we want. Um, and then this allows us to, yep, so can you show your My Collection collection that we just created? So I see there, there are options, there are all open resources, all resources, and you can actually collapse those, can't you? What yeah. it shows in the pane. So, yeah, so there are all your collections. So could you bring up your My Collection collection? Let's see. Uh, I have to add it, I think, right? Okay, so yeah, you go up to add. So there's your My Collection. And now I'll probably need to research just so that to... to or, perhaps, or perhaps go to the New Testament or a very common verse in the... Well, so we were just at Romans 12. We knew there was something there, so let's try that. Yeah. Uh, And 
course, yeah, so here it's oh, following. Right, so yeah, okay. Here we go. Uh, so now we're getting there. So says, here we go. So now that showed up there in yes. your site. Very nice. Right. So this is what I find extremely helpful. I want to know if I'm working on Romans 12.1, I want to know if A.T. Robertson's grammar talks about that passage. So I can quickly consult the grammar. If a grammar is interacting with a passage, you know, in my research, I too want to interact with that, or at least I want to benefit from the insights of what's being discussed. So for me, this is key. You can set one up for the biblical language grammars or Greek grammars only or Hebrew grammars, and then um, you open up cited by, and then did you want to talk about link sets real quick, Paul? Because uh, yeah. that's going to be key to using yeah. this. So uh, just like what I had done. Um, so here we have, I mean, NIV 84 and Romans 12, one, and, and you see this little A in the tab. <clears throat> so that's basically said, I've set up a link set for the A group. It's kind of like a scroll group in paratext, but you, if you click on again on these little three dots in the resource, I'm pointing to right here, these three dots. And then that'll bring up this menu and you see link set and A through F or none. And usually it's none, but if you click on A, then that's your, that's gonna be your one particular scroll group here. And so what I've done is I've now <coughs> connected my translation guide, <coughs> but I could also connect this cited by here, to the same link group or to follow. Follow is another one. Basically follow will, I think will follow any type of, uh, verse passage or whatever is currently active, but I tend to like to set it to a very specific group. So I'm gonna again just say to A. So now whenever I'm in A, I can go to a new passage here uh, in, in NIV again, Genesis 1.1. And anything that is in that A group is eventually gonna to try to follow. Yeah, so there we go. The translation guide is now kicked in as, as has a cited by. One so important it'll just caveat. Uh, one important caveat on that um, is that uh, scroll groups are a little different in Logos than they are in Paratext. In Paratext, if you are on verse 2 and you click inside verse 3, everything will scroll to verse 3. But uh, the way that scroll groups work in Logos, they're designed more for reading through the text. And so the scroll group will actually be whatever the verse that is at the top of the window. So if you want to, if, like if you wanted to focus on, on three right now, you would scroll down um, instead of, um, and you see it went to two and it goes to three, um, or use the arrow keys. Yeah, that, that, those, those arrow buttons are great for moving to the verse. Um, so you may notice that it seems a little less responsive um, when you're moving around in Logos, the, the windows don't refresh as often. And that's just because they, they look at that a different way. Yep. Cool. Yeah, no, that is one of my favorite features. I love this cited by pane. You create collections. Um, I also have one for dictionaries and encyclopedias because uh, I think my Logos library has something like 5,000 resources. Now, they're not all equally relevant or equally helpful. And I certainly want to prioritize, say, Klein's Hebrew dictionary over say Brown Driver Biggs or something like that. So limiting the collections really helps us. I think you pointed it out well, uh, Paul, that this helps us narrow down our library to focus in on what we consider to be key resources or resources that we think will help us in uh, a given passage. Okay, good. Um, yeah, it's so not like searching the internet. You don't necessarily want to search the whole internet sometimes for one thing. You want to search a site or, or you know, so a way to to limit again what what you're all what you're searching over is to create a collection. Okay. Yeah. Well, Drew is frozen here. I'm yes, just no, that's good. All right. Uh, okay. Good. I'd like you to show us, Paul, some of the more powerful list of all the passages in the pastoral epistles that contain the lemma pistos. Okay. Break did it I, down again. Did I cut out? So, pistos uh, in the pastoral epistles. Yep. I want to see a list of passages that contain pistos in the pastoral epistles. Okay. So, how are we going to go about it? Walk us through this. We're going to open up a search pane. 
Yep. And I'm going to go to, in my case, I would probably would use morph because I want to find all the variants of the pistos lemma rather than just, uh, and you could do, you could do it for, probably from English as well, but for me, I'm going to do it for, from Greek because that's what I know best. Uh, I'm going to use uh, Nestle Elan Greek New Testament. You probably would have UBS 5. Let me, let me go to UBS 5 just to make sure you, we're all using the same thing. <laughs> Um, to type Greek, you can either change your computer's keyboard or you can use this little keyboard key on the side here and go to Greek. I'm going to use my computer keyboard because I know it's mapped to, to what I like. Um, let me just change it real quickly. Okay. So now I'm going to type in pistos and it doesn't care about the, um, the accents in this case. But what I really want too is making sure again that I'm searching on the lemma. So yeah. what I'm going to do again here is type lemma colon pistos. So it's going to search for all instances of pistos. In this case, it's in the Old Testament. Um, no, I didn't like that. Uh, let's try this again. Pistos. So while he's searching for that, um, when you open up a search window for the first time, uh, there is a blue link there for help. And Logos help is really good. Uh, in many applications, you don't look at help unless, thing, unless you are hopeless. Um, but in this, in this application, um, the help, help resources can be very good. And uh, so if you want to learn about, you know, Bible and basic and media and clause and morph and syntax, there's really great information on the help explaining how to use it. And there's a lot of good stuff on the Logos wiki on, for example, searching. Uh, I'll put a link to that in the chat. So I started in the whole New Testament. Now I want to scope it down to the pastoral epistles. And so if I click on the passages, all passages button here, you'll see it has some predefined groups. Uh, all passages, Matthew goes to the books itself, but then it has common divisions. So I can say like Pauline epistles or general epistles, or Johannian literature. Um, I don't see actually pastoral epistles, so I probably would need to create something like that. Uh, let's see. So I guess the way we would do that is just by in the box there where you can type in, I think you can just give it a list of books, right? So right. you could type in 1 Timothy, um, 2 Timothy, Titus. Right. Whoops, doesn't want to freak there. Okay. So I got my Greek keyboard active here. Uh oh, yeah, we're typing in Greek. Yeah. Now, what I find helpful about the search box there is, I know you switched your keyboard to Greek, Paul, but oftentimes I'm too lazy to do so, and I just start typing Greek or Hebrew lemmas with my English keyboard, and uh -huh. it seems like Logos is pretty good at predicting or finding what I'm trying to type. So if I just type pistos or Torah with my English keyboard, just using Roman characters, it normally pops up kind of a predictive text thing suggesting that I search for the Greek or the Hebrew lemma. Um, yes. And Timothy, uh, two Timothy. Yeah, and um, how about our friend uh, Titus? And somebody suggested Philemon, but is Philemon considered part of our... Uh, Pastorals? I feel like this is a, a Bible quiz. Um. So you see now, when I've entered in these with commas, it also gives you an option to save these as a as sort of a, a yeah. subset collection. So yeah. I can say save. I've got those three available. So if I then select that, <laughs> then... <clears throat> Right, so now we've got the, the subset and I can do my search. So I messed up my text. <laughs> okay, come on, get out of here. Uh, 
one challenge is that when you learn how to use all these filters, you also have to learn how to undo all those filters for the next time you want to search a little wider. Oh, it's not yeah. always easy to undo the, all the filters that you just set. Oh, that's a good point. Because if you forget and you get frustrated, oh, why isn't this finding, why isn't this finding results in Matthew, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Well, you've limited it to, right, um, to, to Hebrew, for example. To remember oh, yeah. the range filter that you put on. Yes, good. All right, so we've got this. Um, now, I want to manipulate this data a little bit, Paul. What are my options? I see here that Logos gives me, yep, aligning it is helpful. I can see where they all occur. Analysis will give me some fun stuff. Um, so that will give me some options. Yeah, this is good for sorting the references. Can sort it by book or sense. Another um, thing you might like is this add versions here. So if I click the add versions, I can say NIV, for example. Whoops, get out of Greek again. NIV. And now it'll bring them up side by side. Share it. It didn't take. Try again. You're right. Versions. All right, because we've just got the Greek there. And if my Greek ain't that great, maybe I want to add a, an English text or a French text or something to help me. There. Okay. So now we got right. parallel. You can add multiples here, so you get a nice multiple view, kind of like a par you know parallel scrolling view of, mm -hmm. of your texts. You can so also is, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say. So this is the lemma. So it's the word group, the pistos word group. So I see pistevon. Um, it looks like did I see some participles? here and everything so you can of course narrow this down but we've got yeah so it's just going to be very broad good yeah sorry i was inter i was interrupting you paul go ahead no you that's fine all right root, so root, there's a difference yeah. between root and depending on the it also depends on the resource i'm not sure if uh this one supports it or not um some some resources like i think it's more in the hebrew where you, you can search on root versus lemma and it is very different um and so like Let's, let's look at that for a moment. So if I go into BHS here, <clears throat> come on. Uh, okay. So if I wanted to search, say, on uh, Haor, I can right click on Haor. And that selected more than I wanted, but you see that the selection here yep. has Haor, and then it will start to populate this left hand side a little bit further in a moment, I think. Yes, so you see that it has Ha, the article, and then Or as a light, as a noun. Mm -hmm. And so that's in this case, if I click on that, it's going to say, this is lemma. Uh, I probably need something like a verb for the root for the uh, seeds to get a verb. Um, yeah, you could use amar, or one of the things, one of the things at the beginning, one of the, the initial uh, word of a uh, verse. Yeah, there yep. you go. Uh, okay. Yeah, so here we have, uh, it's, again, it's, it's, it's uh, only the, uh, the lemma. No, but that's that's our. Yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm trying to remember. There are certain resources where you'll see a difference between lemma and root. Oh, um, I see. In this case, anyway, you, you can choose between the prefix, uh, preposition, or, or conjunction, and or the, the the root, and then you can search here then in different ways. So you can when you're when you first come in, you're frequently frequently going to see selection selected. That'll be basically the surface text, but not, may not be what you really want to search. And so if you're wanting to search on a lemma, you click on the lemma down in this left-hand side, and that configures the options on the right-hand side. Anything you select on the left is going to change what's available on the right. So one thing we could do is like a Bible word study. That's a common, nice yeah. thing you like to see, which is a pretty rich uh, view. Mm -hmm. 
and it's good to remember as well that if we had configured configured our double click in the settings to search then with a simple double click on by Yomer, then we would have been able to, I think that would have then searched on the lemma in BHS, would it not? Right. So now we're starting to see this, uh, some of the lemma information about it. You'll see uh, in this root section, we'll probably get the kind of the circle graph in a moment. So while that's loading, um, one of the things that you can do to improve performance um, of, of Logos is closing uh, those groups that, are, that now have the little bars that they're loading. Uh, when they have to, or if you minimize those by clicking the arrow so that it points to the side instead of down, then uh, the next time that you run this a Bible word study, it's not going to bother to open those. Um, and so the ones that if you, you really don't use something often, it's best to collapse it so that it doesn't take the time to go dig out through your resources and grab all those pieces if you're not interested in it. Uh, that makes a huge difference in the tool. Right, so that's the Bible word study. We're searching on the lemmas. I want to do something more powerful and pretend, potentially something very helpful here, Paul. If okay. we could try out a morphology search. Um, now, when it comes to biblical Hebrew, I am no Sophia Pitcher. And I see Sophia is in, um, is one of the participants. She's in our chat box, expert in biblical Hebrew. I am no Sophia. And so I need all the help I can get. And one thing that I find very helpful is having Logos um, style proper names in BHS a certain way. And that's simple. I mean, this is so embarrassing to admit in front of so many people, but that is simply so I do not try to parse a proper name. I mean, how embarrassing if you're like struggling to understand what something is in Hebrew and it's a proper name. So what I do... Kind of like how I have Elohim here in brown, right? Yes, you've got Elohim. So show us how we can do that. For example, is there a way... I mean, I know there is, but show us how we could, for example, tell Logos to style all proper names in biblical Hebrew a certain way so they stand out in those resources. Okay. Uh, I'll probably need a little bit of your help here too with that. Uh, so if I'm, I'm going to get rid of my... my uh, passage list, First Timothy through Titus is not going to help in BHS. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do an entire Bible in this case. Yeah. And then you're going to want to do, um, if I do an at sign, so the at sign is what tells us uh, wh what kind of morph you're going to use. Um, so let me type an at, and then you'll see these parts of speech that are possible in, in this case in the SESB uh, BHS text. So here we have uh, articles, conjunctions, adverbs, negatives, interrogatives, adjectives, nouns. So we're probably gonna want the noun option. And then yeah. we're gonna say to proper noun, right? Uh, proper. Now look at all those options. This is a reason why it is just unbelievable that we get all of this for $50, Paul, and that the Logos engine is for free. The fact that you have all these options available to you, I mean, this is so powerful. You can conduct a search and create a visual filter for any combination of these features. You, if you wanna know where are all the imperatives in the book of Exodus, in the Hebrew text, boom, you can search for it. Where are all, I mean, you can just see where are all the dual forms. You can find it. And it gives us this very helpful menu so that we don't have to try to memorize this crazy syntax and abbreviations for all these things. But it gives us this very helpful pop-up menu. And you got there by typing at. Is that yeah. right? So you do the at Sorry. symbol and then it pops up the menu. Okay. So and you need you, to be in that morph, uh, on that morph selection for that to work. Okay. Yes. All right, so you've got, so we've created a search that shows us where all the proper names are, and that's helpful if we just wanna know where they are. Now, I don't always need to have that list of references open before me, and what I like to do then with a particularly helpful search is create a visual filter. So can you walk us through that, Paul, going yeah. from a search to a visual filter? Yeah, so the most direct way from this, now that I've created this search and found all the hits, Again, if I go to these three dots here, if I click on that, you'll see 
save as visual filter on the, hmm. the make list. So just bang All right. so on that. We've done our search and then we've gone up into the very helpful hamburger menu. You, you call it a, called it a kebab. I call, yeah, it, right. I call it a hamburger. So there, could you pull that menu back up just a second, Paul? Because there are a number of helpful options here. Um, okay. Sorry, that just created my filter, but let me go back there for a second. Come on, slow poke. Okay. Save yeah, there as we go. Filter, save as word list, save as passage list, send to inline search. Yes. Yeah, there's lots of things you can do really helpfully from here. You can, when you save, like if you want to do something, put this out to a Excel spreadsheet, for example, you can use the print export and that will let you choose Excel as an output option or you can set it to a PDF or whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, and two, you see here, I found this very frustrating one time when I was trying to search, um, what was I trying to, I was trying to search on like a very specific word. So I was trying to search for um, like basket but I kept getting reference, references to baskets, plural. And I think I had the option match all word forms or match equivalent references or something like that turned on. So it's good to remember if you're not getting the results that you expect, if you know, for, example, for instance, there are references to baskets, plural. Um, wait, no, what I'm trying to say. If you just want baskets, it singular, but you're getting references to baskets plural, it's a good idea to check under the hamburger menu to make sure you don't have one of these settings ticked if you're not getting what you expect. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Sorry, I'm kind of- All, wor all word forms would be the one you're talking about. That gets the plural and the, the masculine and the feminine or whatever of that same word, the inflected forms of that same word. Yes. So if you want to search the exact text, so you would turn off match all word, or word forms. Yes. And if you hate having like, a thousand search windows open. You can just click this one send searches here too. And any, any kind of search you're going to do is going to reuse that search, that one search pane, which is another okay. thing to do. Good. So where we want to go now is to a visual filter. So I've set up a search that I think will be helpful for me, not simply as a passage list, but as an ongoing, um, this is a query. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. An ongoing query. Thank you. Um, so we, we found what we wanted in the search box. Then we went up to the hamburger. We clicked create a visual filter. And, and this is what it created. All right. Okay, good. Yep. So now I can type proper names as say the title of this visual filter. Right. And then maybe I want to give it some nice formatting. So what formatting would I, would I want to give to all proper names? If I click on this little formatting drop down list here. It'll give you all kinds of options, and you can actually add to these options by playing with the highlight tool as well, which is a different, different another tool. But we can start from the top, like maybe maybe you want to highlight all proper names, like with this crazy uh, red squiggly line with yellow highlighting. So I click that, then then it will enable that in my in my BHS. Now I might have to select it intentionally. So now I've created that visual filter. There's this little three dots uh, button on the top of the resource, and you have to scroll down to the bottom to get to the visual filters, and you never see proper names now shows up. And so now that, that uh, visual filter will be applied. It might take a little while the first time because it's gotta go through the whole resource to, to, color, it, to color it up. I probably want to go to a good passage with lots of names. There we are. We're starting to get one. So there's Yahweh. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, one, one trick you could also do is if you wanted to um, highlight singular or uh, singulars and plurals, you could put single or single underlines or double underlines. Pretty much any feature that you want to be able to show, you can uh, choose layers of, uh, of formatting to turn on or off. Mm. Yeah, I, for me, for the Hebrew proper names, I probably wouldn't use something as loud as the yellow. No, with the red. <laughs> I would use something like the subtle brown. Um, and in Purple. fact, that idea comes from the Reader's Hebrew Bible. Um, the printed edition of the Reader's Hebrew Bible does something like that in there. Um, very helpful. Now, for the more extreme or the more um, eye-popping styling, I use that for, in the Greek New Testament, I have a filter set for the particle de. 
I've got one of those too. So that um, I can quickly see narrative or an epistle. And I find that very helpful. And I, I don't mind it being more striking because I want my eye to kind of chunk the text according to kind of natural discourse. Um, and so doing a similar filter for all the de, des, de, all the occurrences of de in the Greek New Testament is very helpful. And I don't mind that being loud and popping out because there usually aren't that many, as many as proper names. So that's another application of that. Um, yeah, and something that's interesting there, uh, so you might use de as, as a very specific form. You might use also additional like related forms like uda, right? Uh, and so if you want to get those, you can, you can also capture those or udenia, right? So those are all kind of de related terms. Uh, so a way to get that is to use again, more like the, the underlying form rather than just the surface form. So if I go to my visual filter for my de and related terms. <clears throat> I have too many visual filters turned on over there. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of, <laughs> No, but it's good. It allows you um, to customize it the way you want. So you can have multiple filters for this, that, and the other. Um, no, it's, it's fantastic. So this is an example. Instead of just using the lemma de, I use root de. And that is then able to let me find all these other forms, ude mia, ude, uh, mida, you know, a variety of, 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 of kind of compound forms. Because principally, I guess, if, if that is still used as a, as a development marker, even with the negative uh, attached to it, then it's still probably going to have some of that force. So it's something else to think about. Okay, yes. No, that's fantastic. No, this is definitely my favorite feature of Logos is the visual filters. It's applicable in so many ways. For example, for KTOT, I've been researching uh, Torah, and I created a visual filter uh, that finds and highlights all terms with the sense law or teaching or instruction. And so when I'm perusing a passage, those terms are highlighted in a subtle way. So at a glance in a given chapter, I can see where all the law terminology occurs in that chapter, very helpful. Um, but that's applying the sense, I think that's the sense um, search item. Okay, um, so we've talked about search, prioritizing resources, collections, Bible word study, that's a tool. Um, kind of about, one of the last- uh, Exegetical guide. The, ex the guides, yep, we could, yep. Do you wanna talk about the guides? I was hoping to, the last thing I was hoping to cover is clippings. Um, but go ahead, Paul. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe Matt can talk about this. Uh, now I've got it open, but. Yep. So uh, the exegetical guide is or is a little bit a canned exegesis, um, but um, when uh, okay, so we're waiting for that to come up. You can go ahead and run it on that, that on that that verse. That's fine. Um, the most interesting thing for me is this word by word that is currently closed. Can you open up word by word? Um, this tool uh, will go through and find the interesting words. It will it will leave out some of the some of them, but it will find the major interesting words, and it will go ahead and do a cursory lookup of those resource or of those. Um, uh, there it come, it's coming up now. Cursory lookup of those words uh, in your dictionaries. So uh, if you're reading along and you just kind of want some help, is oh what was that word again? I don't remember. Uh, you could look over here and it's, you know, Helios is obviously sun, Astron is star. Um, but uh, just having that, op that exegetical guide open can uh, give you some uh, hooks to, to hang on to when, you're, when, you are, when you do have a Greek text or a Hebrew text in front of you. Um, it can be quite handy. And there are, there, are, there are a lot of other things in these guides. And all the guides are customizable. If you find something that you really like, like the word for word, word by word, you can add that to another guide or create your own guide. Right. You can customize Logos way beyond what you would ever want to. <laughs> so. For sure. Yeah. A similar kind of thing, uh, just to carry, carry on, something like that uh, Drew was mentioning earlier about searching in all grammars or, or all lexicons, something that's not obvious to a lot of people is, if I wanted to do, again, like a, 
a search on Pareno here, uh, one thing I can do is I can, instead of searching for the lemma in, uh, in a specific lexicon, I can do a power lookup. And that is a really nice way to see kind of highlight entries for all the lexicons I have in my library. And once this finishes populating, I'll do that. Um, there we go. So down here under lookup, you see some abbreviations of specific lexicons. But if I click on power lookup, it brings up this little pane. <clears throat> and we'll show all those lexicons in a moment. So while that's loading, you'll notice that uh, the little icon for power lookup, which is a lightning bolt, he has dragged that up to the toolbar at the top. Anything you find useful in Logos, you can drag it up to that toolbar at the top so that you can get back to it without having to dig through menus. Um, if you find an option you like, just drag it to that area and it will appear. Uh, obviously, you only have a few inches of space there to work with, so you will need to prioritize it, but it can be very handy. And so now you see this power lookup pane. Now I have all these kind of abbreviated entries from all my lexicons for Pareno, and it's a direct way to get to any of those lexicons too if I want to look at a specific one. And this will also generally follow your prioritization order. If something is not in your priority, they'll then probably just be alphabetical order after that. But. Okay, so clippings. Yes, clippings. Um, so what I find is often I want to do some research on a given topic or the translators, while I'm consulting, translators will ask me a question that I need to revisit and kind of brush up on in the evening. And I just have to tell them, listen, I need to read up on this and I'll get back to you. Um, so what I find helpful is creating um, a collection of clippings on a given topic. So for example, if I don't really understand how Sheol is used in the Old Testament and say, I just wanna do some reading on it. Now, I might do reading in dictionaries, I might do reading in encyclopedias, I might do reading in a variety of resources um, that aren't necessarily in the same category. So there might be a monograph, a book on that, commentaries are gonna talk about it, encyclopedias are gonna talk about, lexicons are gonna talk about it. And I need a way, for me at least, to bring all of that research together so that I can see it. And um, what I love about clippings is it helps me create kind of a scrapbook on a given topic. So Paul, could you, um, I don't know if we wanna use Sheol as a topic, but could you show us what that might look like to create a scrapbook of snippets of clippings on this? Yes. Um, for that, you basically you would create a notebook, I think is what you're thinking about. Well, there looks, I guess there's a clippings document you can create. Mm -hmm. I've usually used notebooks, but if we, maybe you can guide me through this a little bit. Yeah, so they're two okay. separate things. Um, notebooks uh, are, and when you're reading through a text and you add a note, um, uh, that extra text that is like a footnote almost that you've added, um, that uh, they go into the notebooks and you can organize and arrange them there. Uh, clippings are actually selections of text that you have extracted a copy of from the resource. So you um, usually you would, so if you were interested in, for example, that uh, Acts verse 20 or 2720, you yep. select it. Select the whole verse, for example, or the words that you're interested in keeping. And then yes. when you move over to the clippings window, you just hit the add clipping button. Okay. But you, you don't even have to, yeah, you don't actually have to pull, go through the menus. You, if you already have the clipping open, then you should be able to add a clipping, I hope. It looks grayed out. Uh, I'm not sure why it's grayed out. You have to first. Oh, yeah, there you go. Yeah, so this yes. is what I find helpful is whether I'm reading on my iPad or my phone or working on my laptop, I find either a key verse or a key statement from a commentary or a lexicon or encyclopedia. And I think, well, I want to revisit just this one quote or this one idea later. And I want to bring it all together. You just highlight it and then you add that clipping to that. So if I named this collection of clippings, um, Sheol, you could have a Sheol, I don't know, what would we call it? Sheol clippings. And then all the little snippets would be grouped together. And at a glance, you could see what you think are the most pertinent bits 
related to that topic. Nice. And so it's like your own OneNote or Evernote or something across yeah, your, yeah. your yes. resources. And so you're pulling out the best, you're taking snippets from every, res every type of resource. I'm not necessarily making notes myself on Sheol, but I'm bringing together what I think are the most salient bits to then revisit later. And you can add your own notes if you want. I see there's a little notes thing. And uh, for me, this just seems to be a really quick way to bring together um, key ideas, to, have a, to create a quick overview for myself. So I would do reading and then like highlight this, add to clipping, add to clipping, add, add to clipping. Mm -hmm. And then on the next day when I wanna review this topic with translators or whatever, I could pull that out and say, okay, this, 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 this. And it also gives you a back reference that NIV 84 that is blue there. If you click on that in the clipping, uh, that will jump you back to, that will open up the resource where you, where you pulled it from. If you uh, realize that you want, you want to go back and read the rest of the paragraph. Mm -hmm. um, right. That so, can be very handy to, ha to have that right. to go back. Or you can hover over it and it'll also give you your little yes. view of it. Yep. 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 And two, so while Logos gives you the feature to take notes, Logos also gives you the ability to highlight things, but for a big block of text, I don't necessarily want to highlight two paragraphs in a commentary. Um, it's much more feasible, much more user-friendly to add that as a clipping um, rather than highlighting the whole thing. So there's a variety of ways that we can interact with these resources and kind of pull out the most salient bits. Yeah, so like along the highlighting thing, as you're saying, depending what you're what, what you're trying to do with the highlighting, it may be, may be a different thing. But for like, uh, I was doing a project with discourse analysis last fall, and here you see in my NIV, I've got these double square boxes around what's basically embedded uh, text or embedded quotes. And this didn't come, I didn't do this actually on the NIV, I did this on the Greek, and if you were to look on the Greek, um, it's coming through the NIV because of the the kind of uh, reverse interlinear feature. But if I turn this on, you'll see uh, a variety of things. Let's see. So I created some notebooks and some, um, let's see, some else. So, uh, Swami, as, as I said, bef or said before, um, notebooks are collections of notes that you have put in other documents, in your Bibles, in your commentaries, those notes, that, footnotes, basically, that you have added. And then clippings are when you pull text out of a document to put in a collection, for example, by topic. Yes. So I think of notebooks as content notes that I take and I think of clippings as content that other people have created. So I want to pull, clippings allows me to take other people's things and bring it all together in a collection where notes allows me to put down my thoughts. But clippings is other people's thoughts brought together. Notebooks is my thoughts brought together. Well, notebooks can also be a collection of tagging. And that's kind of what I did in, in this, in this mm -hmm. case where I had, I created a, a notebook of, of irrealis types of markers. Hmm. And I created this kind of taxonomy of things. And so if I click on one of these, for example, adversatives, you'll see then what I have is then a list of a bunch of text in, in, in Acts 27 that I was considering an adversative particles or markers of some kind. And I'd done that by selecting the, the element in, in the text and then adding it to this notebook. And then once you've added it to the notebook, it has features for how you can highlight it. Oh, right. That's so new you have to a me. Note, you can have like a note icon. Yes. Or, right. or, or again, a, or a highlight. And mm. with your highlighting palette, then you can also create specific highlight names. So I'll show you that real quickly, too. We'll probably get at the end of the time here shortly. Yes, I was hoping to shut it down by 5 o'clock my time, which is in nine minutes. So why don't we make this kind of the last thing we explore here? And then I just have some kind of concluding. Sure. Uh, we should probably show the docs window. A bunch of people have been asking, once I create all this wonderful content, how do I get back to it? Uh, showing them through the docs window uh, might be helpful so that they can get back to things. Sure. So I just opened the highlighting tool. 
And there's a bunch of kind of default highlights, which are the ones that we were looking at earlier, where you have just front, you know, red, red highlight or red background, or these kind of, you see some things that are not very necessarily intuitively named, but you can create your own set. And so I created a palette. My, I created my own palette called Irealis. And I gave names then to these different kind of colors and looks of things. So I have, for example, imperatives. I want to be always in bold. So I, if I click on that, I can, if I want, let me say if I want to add a new one, but I'll show you then what's underneath it. So if I add a new style, then that will give me an option to create a, a new named highlight type. So I can give it a title, my new type, new highlight. And then you get options for styling, for background, for text effects, for a label. So I can even do something like in BART where we used to have the little uh, pre-text pre before something. So I can say like uh, highlight or just say hi here. I'm gonna say, make that super script. And then that'll show up here. You see in this little preview, it shows a little high and super script text before whatever is selected. So now I've created this, I can save it. And that will show up in my Irealis list here in a moment. You see here it says, hi, new highlight. Now if I select some text here, uh, CTS, come on, select. Here we go, and then click on my highlight. Then it'll it'll apply that highlight to that text in a moment. And you see now it's got this little pre-label high right mm. in front of it. So it's very much like uh, Levinson's uh, Bart markup, for example, if you're familiar with that. Well, that is cool. And then you can, so once you've applied these highlights consistently, then you guys basically have that as a new kind of thing you can turn on uh, in your in your content, which I've mm -hmm. done here. So here you're seeing in my Greek here, I've got again, all the embedded quotations that are in the bold, or, sorry, in the double box. And I have uh, futures in purple. I have uh, the versatives with this kind of red highlight. And so this is a way that I'm doing my research on, on Irialis mm -hmm. in, the, in this particular passage uh, Irealis is a marker in discourse of peak. Come, uh, if you have a cluster of Irealis features, it's it's indicating that you're close to a peak. And so this kind of actually demonstrated that for me. And it's a very nice way of, of then doing that research and, and maybe creating a, a PDF with that output. You can you know make that for your publishing or for your articles. Mm -hmm. Nice ways of, of capturing that information. Yes, that's fantastic. And it lets you, it helps the text really jump off the page, helps you quickly see um, in a visual format the information that's kind of encoded in the language. Just phenomenal. You know, I've got our brother, the patron saint of Bible scholars and Bible translators behind me here, Saint Jerome, and he could not even have imagined the power that you are harnessing in your research there, Paul. So way to go. Good. Well, we want to wrap up our time here. Um, we've got about five minutes. Paul, thank you so much. Thank you as well to everyone, uh, to all the facilitators who've been answering questions in the chat box. Um, what are ways that we can go forward with learning about Logos? Now, I'm convinced that one of the best ways for us to do so is simply by using it, not being afraid to click around, experiment, try new things, just play with it. Just start clicking, explore what's in, under all the menus, using the helps that are built into Logos. Like Matthew said, very powerful. They've gone to great lengths to make sure that the software is, um, is user-friendly. Um, what's Doug saying here? Oh, Doug, no, we're so glad that you're here, Doug. Um, wait, hang on. My Zoom is acting strange. I guess it's just me with the video now. I better make sure that I'm here. Just look at St. Jerome. Um, so what am I saying? Yes, what are ways we can go for it? So there's the Faith Life Group, um, the SIL Translators Workplace Faith Life Group. If you've got a question, um, I know a lot of people have found that helpful, posting your question or your concern there in the Faith Life, Life Group. Uh, don't hesitate as well to read in the, um, 
Logos support forums. They've got a wiki. They've got a forum. There's also Ling Trans. They've got videos. I think they even have some stuff on YouTube. I'm pasting some links in here now. Um, I think that's probably the best way to get some support. So remember that if you have a problem with TW Logos, remember that the software, the engine, the bookshelf itself has been constructed by Logos. So don't necessarily think it's SIL's problem that there's an issue with Logos, but that you should probably, your first port of call should be to check out Logos resources as it's their bookshelf. If you have a problem with licensing or access to resources, that would be more of an SIL issue. So I think uh, I just wanted to make that clear at the beginning, who to kind of chase after for support in different areas. Now, we as a community of practice involved in Bible translation, we're very much interested in sticking together and um, building capacity in one another to make the most of these tools. That's why we wanted to hold this kind of webinar um, to kind of explore ways that we can use this in our Bible translation work. Um, I wanted to let people know as well that you should join the Faith Life Free Books group. As soon as a resource is made free for Logos, um, there's usually a post in there. And I've gotten loads of free resources over the years. Some of it is good, some of it is less good, but all of it is free. So you can't complain too much. Remember as well that every month, Logos gives away a book. So you want to check back at the beginning of the month and just buy that free resource. You can add some really stellar resources to your library yeah. for free. Um, and then lastly, everybody should know that Logos currently has a 30% um, off discount code, Labor Day, for 30% off the purchase of any resource. I think it's just good once. It's not good on base packages or pre-orders or community pricing or anything like that. But if there's one resource that you've been eyeing to buy, now could be a good chance. 30% off is decent, or you could wait for it to come on sale. Um, what I want to end with, Paul, though, is what are our options? If we see that there's a resource that we'd really like or we think would be useful to Bible translation practitioners, but it's not part of TW Logos, we don't want to come across as ungrateful for all that we have. And we don't want to be, we come across as those to whom you give an inch and they ask for a mile. But is there, are we, I mean, I, I hate to even bring this up because you've worked so hard and people have been so generous already, but is it worth exploring at all the possibility of adding other resources or do you find those sorts of requests really annoying and inappropriate? No, I think they're great. A lot of times they're things I haven't thought of. And if you haven't seen my, Probably my tendency is to focus a lot more on the biblical language types of resources, but if you have some, some very specific things, I tend to uh, avoid a little bit more of the theological resources, primarily because Bible translation isn't necessarily theological. I, I mean, that's, you know, I, if, if, if you understand where I'm, where I'm going with that. Um, I know, but anyway. we, can't conclude, we can't conclude with that remark. <laughs> Sorry, I'm interrupting. Go ahead. Yeah. No, it's fine. Um, it's easier to justify, at least to the publishers, if we're asking, yeah. I think, too, for resources that are specifically helping translation. Exegetical yeah. resources, of course, are a lot, a lot easier to, to, to talk about. Um, but what I was going to say is, yes, please do either drop me a line or put it on the on the Faith Life group. I'll usually catch it there. Um, and if it's certainly if it's something from Zondervan, it's a pretty likelihood that we'll get it. Uh, it may take a while for me to process it and get into a, a you know a collection of things we might ask for them, but but they're very also, helpful. if it's something from Faith Life. Resources from Faith Life, from Logos themselves, are usually accessible, as I understand. Uh, within limit. I mean, like okay. the, Lexham, the Lexham commentaries, they're not so ready to give us those. Uh, but but you, can, you can at least ask me, and I'll, I can see what I can do. Um, I will say there are some things, of course, that are, that are expensive and we're, we're not likely yeah. to get but we might be able to get a discount. And so the, I would also encourage us to think about if there are kind of communities of practice and you all say, yes, we would all love to have that resource and we would all buy it if we could get it at like 35% off or 40% off or something. If there's, there's different levels of discount that they're willing to give us at certain numbers of, of, of purchases. And so if you, if you are ambitious enough and want to try to coordinate something like that, I can, I can make that happen for you. Uh, so, so please talk to me about that. 
Yeah, I mean, for example, Paul, there are a number of wonderful resources by the German Bible Society, um, like BHQ, for example, Biblia Hebraica Quinta, which I would love, I mean, I've splurged on one volume of it for research on a particular project, um, but I would love to have the full set of BHQ, and you know, that could be a bit cost prohibitive for us. Um, so what you're saying is, if there are a number of us who are interested in BHQ, maybe we could gang together if there were maybe 20 of us, and then we could approach the publisher and say, hey, we've got 20 people ready to buy BHQ right now, what can you do for us? I mean, is there any harm in that? No, not at all. And that's, and that's something we would do. We wouldn't approach the publisher, but we would approach Logos, and Logos would basically mm. give us the, get do the interaction with the publisher. Um, oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, I think we have taken up enough of your time, Paul. Again, every blessing to you, my brother. Your efforts on behalf of the Bible translation movement are simply incalculable. They are just, I can't even pronounce incalculable. There we go, incalculable. Given the tools that you and your team are making available to us all, I, nobody should exit this chat without saying thank you to Paul and his team. Yay, praise the Lord, because, you know, I just look at my brother, St. Jerome up here, with his quill and his codex going at it, and here we are, you know, just spoiled with all the tools we have. Um, Paul, thank you. Blessings to you, my brother. Um, I hope this has been an encouraging time to everybody who's participated. Um, if you would like to see more training offerings like this, um, it's not really my role, but I'm happy to fa help facilitate it. Um, can I ask that people contact you, Paul, or who? I don't know about arranging. I would love to see the baton passed to our, our, our gifted brothers and sisters in the language technology domain to organize more of these sorts of things. I'm sure, sure other people, especially beginners, would enjoy this sort of thing. So maybe people can follow up with you, maybe? I would maybe suggest actually going through Doug first, um, okay. since he's language technology tr training coordinator, right? And so um, that way, at least we can start collecting uh, a number of people from a different region or a specific kind of topic, and then we can co you know coordinate a more focused uh, type of, of uh, presentation. But yeah. Can you just uh, say how the recording will be distributed or notice sent out to people? I will get the recording to Drew, and Drew will make it available on the BT list. Yes, Excellent. I will. Uh, yeah, I will post a link to it on the BT list as well as the Faith Life group. Um, and for anybody who's actively involved in a Bible translation project, you should know that we have a Bible translation email discussion list with over 400 members working with a variety of organizations all over the world. If you would like to participate in that, normally the discussions are more exegetical or translation issue related. Um, so not really technical support as such, but exegetical translational if you if you're interested in joining that i'm one of the co i'm a co-moderator so i can help you get plugged in there so i'll post the recording there as well as um in the faith life group and hopefully it will make its way to everybody but if you in a week or so if you have not gained access to the recording please feel free to email me drew underscore most arrobas seal point org and i will be happy to make the recording available to you. Oh, and there's my brother Wayne. Yes, Wayne coming in with the goodies, the BT list. Yes, we would love to get you on a BT list if you're actively engaged in a um, Bible translation project. Good, so I think this is the part of the webinar where we invite people to turn on their videos and their microphones and appear all at once and talk all at once, if you so as, desire. As I stop the recording. One, yeah, let's two, three, recording. stopping recording. So we can